Okay, so when you're setting up your new document in a design for any of the projects, and I'm just going to go for the sake of um, example here, I'm going to set up four pages, okay? What I want you guys to do is to devote either the beginning or the last page of your entire InDesign document, one of those pages, beginning or the end, to your finished piece, only that piece. Okay, I don't want it dropped onto a page that's of a different size, and I don't think it's necessary for you to write final design on that page or put any other con um, content or narration or anything on it. So part of it is that your final piece might be a different size than the rest of your document talking about your process and your project. So maybe you have eight and a half by eleven inch documents for all of your process and your sketches and your brainstorming and then when you get to the last page and you want to plunk down your assignment it's a long vertical or horizontal page so that can be a little bit confusing so sometimes someone will plop it on and try to make it fit but what you can always do in your pages panel is you can come to this icon right here and it says edit page size and you can make a custom page size or use one of the drop down options to set it so whatever your design is that you've done it on a different um, InDesign document or you've done on a different Illustrator document, you can place it in here seamlessly. So it's going to give me that really nice ta-da factor and then I know that this is your final piece. When you incorporate it with a bunch of other process documents or ones that you don't love, it's hard for me to know which one is the final one, especially if you're not bringing your final printout to class. So give me that final ta-da. Okay? Design is about presentation voicing the message behind our pieces and even when you're just presenting something give me a really nice clean strong presentation so if you have something that is 11 by 17 horizontal you can click on that new page size okay I'm gonna say okay and it's gonna drop a whole new page up here. Um, this is because I had the first page highlighted. If I drag this down to the bottom, okay, then you can place your final piece right in here and have a nice standalone piece. So let me show you an example. Let's pretend that this is final size 11 by 17. I want you to bring it, you know, all the way to the edge, fill the page, make this the final big presentation. If a part of your design was to have some sort of border or to have some sort of white space, then you need to present it in the way that you originally designed it. Also, what you need to think about is the size of the original. So if you guys are designing something and you're designing it to be less than what you're placing it in your main document as, and as is the case here with this sample I pulled from the web, it's incredibly pixelated and the resolution isn't going to match up. So you need your final presentation to be correct size, standalone, really clean, and make sure the resolution is correct as well. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about that? No. Okay. So I just want to make... You want them to go all the way. Yes, but, um, you know, if I want it to look cleanly presented as a final piece, and I tend to like it when it's all the way to the edge or exactly to the sides, because then we can get an idea of what that really looks like in terms of your entire vision. If you place something with a border around it, it you can still kind of frame it and make it look nice, but then it's like, how how did you envision that being printed? What was your final vision for that. A border is much different than something that bleeds off the edge. Yeah. Uh, like let's say you want it to cover the whole 8.5 by 11 piece of paper. Mm -hmm. There's no way, a printer won't do that, right? Because it doesn't print to the edge. If you set up a bleed, will it actually then print? I don't really understand the bleed, I guess. Okay. Will so it ever print to the edge or no? If you were to have it printed by an offset printer, Okay, they can print something and have it bleed past the edge. But this, they do it the same way that we can kind of replicate here on these machine, on these printers. And that is to print it and then trim it. So if you wanted to add a bleed to your document, I'm going to go document setup. I'm just going to add 
a little eighth of an inch bleed right here. Okay. So you can see there's a little red line that's been added outside of the margins of the page. Okay. And what you would want to do when you're actually setting up a bleed is to bring it all the way to the edge, all the way around. It has to fill in. Excuse me, what's happening? It has to fill in all the way around the to the bleed, okay? You can't leave any white space. The reason why they do that is if the paper is shifting and you want to trim it at a particular um, mark, if it shifts a little, you might have some white space. So specifications will say take it all the way to the edge of the bleed, okay? So now when we look at it, our document size is still 11 by 17, but we have this extra eighth of an inch bleed all the way around. So how you would handle that if you were to send that to a printer is if you were to export this, you wouldn't want to make sure that your crop marks and your bleed settings are checked in the PDF. Okay, this is going to show the printer where the artwork should be cropped okay and where that bleed is and usually the crop mark comes before the edge of the bleed because you're going to crop through that area to the size of that paper I have bleed settings set up in my document so you always want to check that and I'll show you guys what it looks like where did I save that to? Let me do this again. Oh, I save it in skateboarder. Here we go. Marks and bleeds. You have to make sure that these are checked every single time. These are your crop marks. So you can see here it's telling the printer to crop along this line like that. So then that's how you replicate and that's how you get the bleed Okay, when you're printing. On these computers for the standard size sheets you can create something similar. But you're never going to get it to print all the way to the edge. These printers will always leave a white mark. So that means that if you were to export this as 11 by 17 with the crop marks you would have to have this all fit to size to print so it will be smaller than 11 by 17 because you're not going to be able to actually have it be 11 by 17 because our paper isn't any larger than that so it would probably be you know you have crop mark area you have about a half an inch around plus the crop mark so maybe you have three quarters of an inch missing from the overall dimensions of your piece so it's going to be a little bit smaller but you could do it. So if you guys were to take, um, I don't, is that your example right there, Guillermo, mm -hmm. with the abstracted woman? That white edge, we have that because it was printed on a printer either in-house or at the copy shop, and it can't bleed off the edge. And then what you can do is you can actually go in and trim that if you wanted to. Okay, so that's it. That's an option that you can set up. But that's how bleeds work. Does that make sense? So you still understand why you'd ever use a bleed because then it actually trims off a part of your image. Like if the printer can't go to the edge anyway, why would you use a bleed? Because it looks like to me the bleed just means that your image is actually going to, to avoid having a white, a white edge. Yeah. So here's an example. This is bleeding off the edge. We don't want but a white border. Printer. Yeah, but when this was printed, okay, this whole thing, each of these images had a bleed. It bled past here, and then when the paper cutter comes down and trims. The difference is with an offset printer, you're always going to be printing on larger sheets of paper than the standard size that fits in these machines. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can you print a bleed on... You have to do that as well on an offset printer. You always have to set up a bleed if you want it to bleed off the edge of the paper. And that is to have that continuous look of the image all the way off the edge. And again, 
you bleed off because if you were to end the artwork right here, right at the very edge, if you had the paper shift in any way while it's being trimmed down, you have the potential of having a white edge of the paper or whatever color paper is showing. So it's dangerous gamble because paper does shift when it's in the printer. So if you build in a bleed a little bit all the way around as the paper is moving through the press, you're kind of covering your ass by having a bleed there. Okay. So you can do you can replicate a bleed when you print from these computers or from these printers. It just won't be at the full paper size that comes out of these machines. So you have to think about that in advance. If you wanted to do an 11 by 17, again, it would be a little bit smaller if you printed it and trimmed it down. Yes? Makes sense? Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Do you guys have any other questions like that about assignments or ha set up documents or anything? Okay. So we're going to roll into this week. Okie dokie. Next week, you're going to be given your midterm assignment. And I've mentioned this before because I want you guys to get your gears turning. It is going to be a video tutorial presentation on a subject involving software or design that you have never done before. Okay? So we know that Martin does custom brushes. So he's not going to be the one that's going to show us how to do that. But if one of you thinks that's interesting, then you can be the one to learn it. You have to teach yourself something new. And you can do that however you want. If you want to watch videos online, if you want to read a book, if you want another student to teach you, however you learn it, that's fine. You just have to have enough competency to come up here in front of everybody and then teach us how to do it. And you're also going to create your own small mini tutorial that you're going to record you're going to use a screen capture software and you're going to turn that into me. Then you're going to replicate that whole tutorial live and in person up here. And we can turn the lights down and you can't really see anybody and you get to like hide out behind the computer and it's not scary. But I want you guys to start thinking about things that you have noticed in this class that other students are doing, patterns for instance, stuff like that. But you have to pick something that's completely new to you and we're going to have a sign up sheet and it's first come first serve with the idea. We don't replicate the ideas because who wants to watch 10, you know, tutorials on patterns? Nobody. And we want to, you know, so that's a rule. So next week we'll have a sign-up sheet. I'll give you more of those instructions, but start thinking about it. So this week is all about color. And you guys are going to be assigned a color poster assignment. And it's actually really fun. And again, you guys get to pick your own subject. You get to pick your own color palettes. And you get to do two versions of your poster. Okay, so let's talk about that right now. Where are we? Now, 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 now. Here we go. Just like always, we're going to start in our sketchbook. I want you guys to really push the idea and the concept of sketching because I want you guys to focus on having a plan and also pushing through some of those initial ideas, which tend to be very cliche and top of mind. So the first idea that we always have when it comes to cr the creative process tends to be something that we've seen before, we've seen recently, we're kind of experimenting with on our own. But I want you guys to continue to sketch and flush some ideas out so then you get to the really fun creative idea that's definitely new and exciting, okay? Plus, it sets up a blueprint so you guys can say, I'm going to tackle this in this way, and it doesn't become as daunting. You guys are starting to learn that this is, these projects are taking a lot of time. Okay, So it's good to have a nice blueprint ready to go. So you're going to start by doing some exercises in your journal per usual, and that includes finding different samples of color. Okay? I want you to find a monochromatic color palette an analogous color palette, and a complementary one, all within some sort of photo or print ad or magazine spread, okay? Then you're going to find examples of two color designs that are going to use tints and screens to achieve um, an entire kind of rainbow palette of colors. So we kind of explored this with the last assignment where you guys had two monochromatic palettes and then you mix them together. And when we were doing the critique in class, you could see that students who had a, a really, really dark, dark blue all the way down to a very, very pale blue, you can create 
um, almost a full color feeling with all of that different value. So you're going to try to find some of those. You're going to cut them out, paste them in your sketchbook. Then you guys are going to find and do a little bit of research on what a duotone, a tritone, and a halftone effect is. And you're going to try to find examples of those and put those in your sketchbook as well. Okay. And then you're going to find um, a color photograph and you're going to download it from the web and you're going to just, you know, throw that into your um, document as well. So I want you guys to see a range of color palettes, get a range of printing types and get an idea of how color is, is used in printed and online um, photos. Then what you're going to do is start thinking about your poster. Okay. The poster is going to combine the image of a famous person, place, or thing, and a related word. Okay. Short phrase, potentially. Depends on what you're doing. But I want you guys to try to stick to one word. Okay. And it's going to relate somehow to that re famous person, place, or thing. So here we have the Beatles with love. Here's the Long Branch Lady, okay, because that's her full name. You guys can play around, or her um, nickname. Here's Imagination, The Critic, Namaste, The Mountains Are Calling, a John Muir um, poster, okay? So try to pick to something, stick with, um, don't give me a full paragraph or a full sentence, like a sh really short phrase or a single word. Working with one word is easier than working with multiple words, okay? Hint, hint. So you're going to start brainstorming and sketching some ideas and subjects for the poster. What is, oh, this is a nice example of a, thank you. We'll pass that around in a minute. Okay, so you're going to end up doing two full color posters that combine this famous person, place, or thing with this word. And you're going to play really close attention to how you're going to incorporate the word in with the subject. The word is not going to be an afterthought. It has to be incorporated into your design. We have to have balance. We have to have unity. Okay. And what you're going to do is you're going to pick a color palette for your first image, complementary, monochromatic, or analogous. Okay. Those are options. Whatever color palette you choose, it needs to be, um, a specific decision on that type of color palette. And I want you to figure out what that kind of color palette is and you're going to state it out in your document. Okay. And I'll go through um, all the different types of color palettes um, and color relationships in a minute with, when I finish this. So then you can do, you can do local color or arbitrary color. Local color is um, realistic arbitrary is playful and you know maybe a little bit abstract and you can assign different colors here's an example where this guy is blue okay that's definitely not a realistic color but it's fun okay playing around with um, that color palette so examples the sky can become yellow to enhance purple backlit tree trunks or a man's hair can become dark blue in an analogous color scheme of cool hues to be kind of creative and funky and play with it, okay? The color palettes you choose should help elevate your design and your message and your typography that you're using. So depending on your subject and the word you want to use, that's where you, how you're going to kind of choose to play around with your color palettes. You can also play around um, and try to use a color palette that seems like it's very disjointed from your subject as well because what you're going to do is do two different color posters. Okay. You're going to have the same subject, the same typography, but you're going to play around with two different color palettes. So you can see how color can deeply affect the different posters that you're creating. Okay. Uh, when you journal and work with your poster design, you should capture your color palette from the screen display. So take some screen captures. If you're working in cooler, if you're sketching on, um, like with color pencils in your sketchbook, make sure you're capturing those and using those and that you're able to describe the type of color palette that you have. So what you're going to include, exercises for your journal, images that you're going to collect from print and web, put those in your um, sketchbooks, and uh, identify the color schemes that are associated with those. 
Then you're going to do sketches and brainstorming of your color poster concept. Okay. Choose a range of fonts to play around with, and I'll show you how I would tackle that in a minute. Then you're going to document your digital process from start to finish. Screen captures, screen captures. Some of you guys are showing me um, screen captures of like your final piece or maybe just the initial brainstorming idea, but I really like to see the process. Like as you're sketching something out, as you bring it into the digital um, element, like how it starts to change and uh, develop. Okay. And then at the end, you're going to have two polished large scale presentations of the final artwork. Okay. Same image, two different color palettes to demonstrate how color is going to impact that message. You're going to include your design narrative. Okay, make sure you include that. That's an automatic 10 points right there when you start to write about your process. Okay. And you're going to supply everything in one PDF document like we've been doing. So when you come to class and we have our discussion, I want you to talk about why you picked your subject, why you picked the color schemes, what those color schemes are, um, and how your typography is related and why you picked the fonts you chose and, and all that different stuff. And then we're going to sit down in class and when we do our critique, you're going to explain all that. Okay, so let's see if we can open this one up. So you can see how two different color palettes completely change the feeling of the poster. This top one has a surrealistic feeling, almost like this guy is floating in the air, and you have this thing about the word mind blow. So you're thinking about this guy just, uh, I don't know, he's on drugs and he's doing something crazy, and it's like the color scheme is all odd. But then when you come down to this next one, it looks like he's just came to an incredibly amazing discovery while he's been in his classroom in front of the chalkboard, like writing out some sort of mathematical equation or something. So you can see how those colors really change um, the overall feel. Okay, And the font that is being used is incorporated into this kind of chaotic, interesting, creative feel. Like it looks like something that was stamped um, quickly on an envelope or in an office. Um, it looks a little ink smudgy. Maybe it reminds you of like a coffee cup smear and that kind of chaotic thing where you're working on a project and you're drinking your coffee and you leave your mug down on your on your homework, okay? So talk about, you know, narr the whole narrative the image, the composition and the format, the colors that you're going to choose. Okay? And you can see that this student played around with different fonts as well. They don't have, this one doesn't have the same impact as the other one. That one's not loading. So this student incorporated some texture and pattern into their piece as well from the um, texture assignment. But you can see this is definitely a cooler color palette. Cooler meaning like the blues and everything on the colder end spectrum of the color wheel. And here we have a warmer one. Suddenly completely changes the feel. This looks like an afternoon sunset. This looks like an early morning stroll. Okay, you can see how it's really changed the, the entire feel and emotion of the design. Okay. So here's our um, different ads pulled out, sketches, process, color palettes, and narrative. Okay. Can we incorporate our narrative like throughout the whole 100%. Most students uh, tend to do it in like a block at the beginning or end. I actually like it when you incorporate it with the different phases because then I can read along as I'm looking at the process. I find that to be um, really interesting. Okay. Does that sound like a fun project? Yeah. Yes, it's Tim Gunn. It says make it work. <laughs> Let's see if this one opens up. Color palettes, Tim Gunn, sketches, 
make it work. And you can see how the type and like how that was arranged was going to be important. So here's a tracing with the pen tool of Tim. He kind of looks like Elton John in this one with the red jacket. <laughs> Here are some different glyphs that were pulled and symbols from Illustrator to give texture. This is a hand-lettered typography. So the student had an idea of how they wanted the type to be. So they scanned it in and then they traced it with a pen tool. And you can see they ended up with three different options. And again, completely changes the look and the feel for each one. So I'm going to talk a little bit about color first to um, get you guys excited about different color palettes. And then I'll show you how I would tackle the setup of this project and how to um, kind of play around with fonts and typography. So color is really fun, in case you guys haven't figured that out yet. Um, so the way we take color in is not, it's not a tangible thing. Color isn't, how do you, how is this? Color isn't a real thing, okay? It is, it is how light is reflecting off of the surface of an object and into our eyes and how our eyes are processing those light waves, okay? So this water bottle appears blue because the light waves are hitting it and every other color is being absorbed into the surface of this except for this blue and it's reflecting back into our eyes. So scary. Weird. Mine blue. So last semester, last semester when we were doing the color um, part of class there was the whole fiasco of the blue and black dress versus the white and gold dress on the internet what did you guys see you saw both I could not for the life of me make it happen I was like ah, I can't see it it was blue and black for me every time weird I don't get it it was totally nutty I swear it was a lie. I mean, I saw a photoshopped one of Vice Versa, and I was like, that's, they're two different dresses. This is so, anyway. Same thing, how our eyes are processing this information, okay? So when we think about color in design, we're thinking of it as an element that's um, contributing to our overall message, okay? It is a characteristic, just like um, line or shape or format. It adds to the overall piece and the complexity. So, let's skip down to here. You can see that color changes depending on the light of day and how we're experiencing something. And Monet and all the impressionistic um, artists, they were really intrigued about this concept of painting with light and capturing how color changes um, in different situations and times of day. So this is the same parliament building Okay, but different times a day. And you can see how the color palette has completely changed from sun breaking through fog to a stormy sky. Okay, it can change in an instant. When we work in a room like this, it's pretty sad. The lighting in these kind of office buildings is terrible. Okay, get outside and start looking how, uh, how color plays in the morning or in the evening. When you go for a walk in the morning before school, check out how the trees look. And then when you get home later in, in, in the evening, look at how dark and rich and um, detailless the trees look at night, okay? Or in the, the light of a lamp on the street. You can really, it's the same object, it just has such different characteristics and feeling because of the different colors that we're experiencing. So there are different, um, elements to color. We've talked a little bit about the qualities. One of them is hue, which is the color itself. So blue, green, red, the basic hue, okay? That's the name that we've given to that color. Then we have the value, which is how light or how dark the color is, okay? Then we have the saturation, how rich uh, and full force the color is versus how diluted it is. So if something's highly saturated, it is a very pure form of that color. If you mix it with white or you mix it with blue or whatever, you're going to desaturate a little bit. So it's not going to be that full force high intensity. And then we also have temperature. 
So we're just talking about how blues are cold and reds are warm. Let me bring this up for a minute. Okay, here's our color wheel. Everything that is kind of hot and warm, like how you expect, okay, yellows and reds and oranges, we have this kind of initial visceral reaction to these colors as being warm. And as you start to pull down into the other side of the color wheel, these tend to be cooler, okay, icy and rainy and kind of um, all the things that we would experience, like a cool forest or um, a running river versus a hot sunset or um, desert sand, okay? So you can kind of um, bring your own um, uh, ex experiences and physical reactions when you think about color. Then you can also have, and this tends to get a little bit confusing, you could have warmer colors on the spectrum that tend to lean a little bit cooler. So for an instance, this area right here where you have yellow and green kind of meeting like a more a yellow green might be considered a slightly warmer green and you can see why because it has more of that, those yellow tones and then here too you know when you start to get into the purple can tend to be a little bit of a cooler warm tone vice versa and depending on how deep you get okay so that's what we talk about when we talk about um, temperature then we have various color rules, and I want you guys to think about playing with color rules for your uh, poster designs because you can do extremes uh, with color rules, and they tend to be automatic rules that just kind of work together. So we think about some standard um, color rules. We think about the analogous color scheme, and these are colors that are next to each other on the color wheel. Can we all say analogous? Okay, we usually get caught up on that at some point. Someone's like, the anal gas colors. And I'm like, no, no. There's nothing anal about analogous, okay? So then if we come over here, no matter where we pull these colors, you can see this is an analogous color scheme. And you can see that these colors look really nice together, okay? Then we have monochromatic, okay, which is tints and shades of one hue. And again, if you play around... You can get a really full range of value and interest with a monochromatic color palette. Triad is when we have three equal distance away from each other on the color wheel. Again, you can get some really great colors. Okay. Complementary, opposite on the color wheel. One of the classics is red and green, which tends to be this holiday, Christmas time of year, okay? Uh, complementary color schemes, really, um, the reason why they complement each other is because they tend to bring out the best um, exciting features of each of the colors. They make each one stand out even more. So when you have them next to each other, there's just this vibrancy, but when they're sitting right next to each other. They that they necessarily don't have if they're like closer to each other on the color wheel, so that's going to have a lot of the impact in your design. Compound is usually a collection of different um, colors, and then you'll have shades, which again is similar to um, monochromatic. Okay, so you guys can play around in Adobe Color slash Cooler and kind of get some ideas for how you want to play around with your color palettes. <laughs> okay, symbolism and color used in branding. So some of us have certain colors that we automatically think about a brand with. We have this immediate brand recognition because of the use of a color. And one of the classics is Tiffany blue. A lot of people know that kind of robin's egg blue color as their brand color and they always use it, and they have a very particular spot Pantone ink that they've mixed, and that's their, their color. And I think they've even tried to trademark it as Tiffany Blue, which is difficult to do because to trademark a color is, I don't know, I don't really think it's fair. Um, but if you think of the red of Coca-Cola or the yellow arches of McDonald's, and we really start to associate a color with a particular brand. 
Um, and then you can also think about how color is associated with an emotion as well. Red tends to have a lot of energy. Light blues and greens tend to be very calming. Um, yellow might be um, hot or uh, playful. Okay, so there's always going to be these different emotions that we associate with colors as well. So when you're doing your design, think about um, the emotions, think about the message, think about your subject and how you want to tie it all in with your color. So here's an example right here of the lithographic or offset printing process. And I wanted to show you guys this because it really... Um, helps paint the picture on how the CMYK process works. We talked about in printing how CMYK are four colors, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And when you're printing, you have a plate that prints that one ink color with the image and varying saturations onto the paper and it stacks up. But how do those four colors work? Well, every time they print, these little halftone dots here start to mix around and they start to make up all of the colors that you see. So when you guys are doing your research and you're looking at cutouts of magazines and in newspapers, try to get a magnifying glass and get low and you can see all those little halftone dots that come together to make up the image and mix together to make all the colors. Okay. There's some videos in here that you guys can watch and I'm not going to play them because then we have to edit them out of this um, lecture anyway. Um, again, so here color relationships, analogous, colors that are next to each other on the uh, color wheel. Here are complementary, green and purple. They help make each other stand out. If you mix two complementary colors together, you get like a brown or a gray, a very like muddy neutral. That's a trick that you could do in your color posters as well. So if you wanted to mix colors together to get like a different kind of neutral shade, you're welcome to do that. Okay, so any questions about color poster and about color in design? Okay, so we're going to play around with color. Great. The next thing that we're going to do in class is an exercise. Hold on, let's see if this works. Sometimes I get with these flash. Videos break. Do you remember what we did for this? And uh, yeah, where is it? Is it under week, uh, week six? Mm -hmm. Let me, I'll see if I can find it, okay? Okay. All right, so there's a video, a short video that you guys are going to watch. And what you're going to do is you're going to watch a video and you're going to learn about resizing photos for print or web. Okay. You're going to read the information below. The importance of 300 DPI images. We've talked a little bit about this in the class already. So you guys kind of have like a basis. But now you're going to go in and you're going to open up a photo, a high resolution image, royalty free from the web. You're going to download it, open it in Photoshop. Then you're going to obtain the image size information, and it's in this video, so we'll get this going. Um, and then from that information, you're going to create a little um, form, you're going to fill this out with the URL for the image. Okay, and I'll show you how to do that. You're going to uh, find out the width of the image in pixels, the width of the image in pixels at 300 ppi, at 72 ppi and the size in megabytes and you're going to do that all in Photoshop. So it's going to give you a really basic run through of how to check an image size in Photoshop. What you can do is high resolution royalty free image. We want it to be high resolution so you can play around with um, uh, a large image for this. I'm going to show you. There's a uh, text point just above that and we'll message, put the text on. There's a text See, line. You can play the video here as well. Oh, that will play? That's oh, okay, sticky. great. I'm going to show you. Super. Okay, high resolution image. You want to view the image if you can. 
I'm going to avoid this kind of download. <laughs> Okay, here we go. You're going to right click on it and you're going to save the image to your computer. But what I want you to do is to save this URL as well. So see wherever I got this from in Google, you want to make sure you save this because you're going to put that into your form for the exercise. So then we can double check to make sure that you got all the pixels and everything correct. Okay. So that's a short exercise. It will introduce you to opening an image in Photoshop and checking image size and resolution. Okay. Questions about color poster? Questions about resolution exercise? Questions about live tracing, image tracing? Exercise from last week, the surfer? Questions on texture assignment. Has anyone started collecting their textures? Oh, okay. I have a yeah. Um, I know you tell us how many textures you're supposed to collect, but was mm -hmm. there a minimum that we're supposed to use in our finished composition? There's no minimum for the composition. Whatever works best. So the student examples, um, there's a lot of texture in a lot of the student examples. Um, but if you wanted to do something that has less texture, that's fine. Or you can incorporate the texture in other ways. Like I showed um, everybody how to use the brushes in Photoshop. Did you stick around for that last week? Yeah. So that counts as texture. Creating, adding a little bit of a filter or, um, you know, stippling in or scanning in an illustration that you've done, you can really take the texture to whatever level you're comfortable with. And I know that you have a lot of um, really great drawing experience and ability, so I'm very curious to see what you end up doing. Other questions about texture assignment? Okay, what is our goal for today in terms of working in lab later? What are we going to work on, everybody? Texture, do you guys have like a particular thing that are we just kind of just doing whatever we can? Okay. All right. We're just going to work. So I'm going to pause this and then we can.